Okay, well, hopefully um, this talk will actually uh, lead on nicely from Jason's talk there, who sort of looked at the economics of the, the two markets, and then the talks this afternoon, uh, after me are sort of more geological and technical. This is sort of the, the link between the, the sort of strategic aspect of things. Uh, I'm also conscious that I'm at a lithium and graphite seminar, and I'm here to primarily talk about rare earths. Um, now, this is not because... Um, uh, I, I, I think that we should be talking about rare earths rather than lithium and graphite, but more that we keep going through these sort of specialty metals booms. Uh, we, had, we had lithium phase one and, uh, back in, in 2007 and eight, and we had the, the rare earths and actually the graphite booms about the same time, actually uh, in sort of 2010 to 12 kind of period, and now we're back into to lithium again. So we keep going through these little cycles, and if we don't start learning from them, we're gonna keep making the same mistakes each time. So I've looked at what, what happened in the, the last rare earths uh, boom and a little, a little bit in the, the sort of lithium phase one, shall we call it, um, to sort of draw out some lessons for the, the, the current, the current uh, companies active in the, in the sectors now. Because um, one of the problems we've had is that the, these, all of these sectors haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. So looking at rare earths, obviously Mollicourt went uh, bankrupt last year. Uh, Linus has struggled um, several years now. Um, moving to, to graphite, obviously we've had a couple of co companies go under just this year. Um, uh, Galaxy in the lithium sector originally, originally struggled. Um, and also there's the issue around reed, reed resources, which I'm conscious it was actually the gold assets that were the problem there. But um, we'll come to why that's, uh, and why that's relevant later. You'll, you'll sort of see why. Um, uh, so what is it about these sort of speciality uh, metals and commodity markets that makes them so difficult? Um, I think most of you will be familiar with this kind of stylized uh, chart usually produced by brokers, sort of the, the investment opportunity of, of, of a mining project. You have a sort of early stage of sort of exploration and discovery, a lot of speculation. That's where your first sort of pop in the stock price comes from. Uh, you then have a period of sort of scoping studies and feasibility studies, permitting, all that kind of thing, before you get the sort of full value of the project coming out when, when it goes into operation. Um, uh, myself, and actually it's really kind of Alan who's, who uh, sort of came up with this idea, he calls these co this a, a convex uh, commodity market. And what we mean by this is that um, it, it, there are two main types of risk associated with a, with a mine project. There's the actual risk associated with the project, the technical implementation of the project, and there's the risk associated with the, with the company. Um, so uh, projects start out very risky, exploration, any given project, you've got a low chance of actually succeeding with that given project. Um, as discoveries are made and you learn more about the project, the project risk drops off significantly. But it's actually replaced by an increasing corporate risk as you start um, t uh, doing more expensive studies, starting to take out debt finance and things like this, the actual risk to the company occurs. So at the beginning, there's quite a high chance of the project failing, but it's probably not going to impact the company. Companies abandon exploration projects all the time. It's not a problem. It's part of the process of exploration. Whereas if things go wrong at the development and early production stage, it's often fatal for a company. Um, so that's the, when people talk about risk and exploration being risky, that's always worth bearing in mind. Um, the, the, these com convex projects are typically things like uh, gold, copper, nickel sulfide. So, you know, classic examples we're all familiar with, sand fire, uh, serious resources, gold road resources more recently. You get this sort of huge jump up. I, I've slightly uh, extended the, um, the, sc the scale so you can see it more clearly, but you get a huge jump up on, on discovery. And actually, that's more or less all of the value of the project is, you know, reports to the, to the company more or less immediately. Um, and that actually sees the, sees the, the company through the, the development, uh, development phase and allows them to raise finance. However, a lot of these uh, the specialty metals markets, rare earths, lithium, graphite, and that, a whole host of other things, um, including commodities such as nickel, where you have the nickel laterites, we would argue, are, are concave, whereas the sulf sulfides are convex, is that they don't get this early stage uh, value accretion when you have the, you know, sort of the geological discovery. It comes much, much later, um, really until the value doesn't come to the company, really until they're the sort of proof of concept and well into solid production uh, and making money. Um, so just to, 
slightly busy chart here to, to give you an idea of what we're talking about. This is sort of uh, the, 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 the graph of the Linus share price uh, since 2001 for, for 10 years as it was sort of going through, a, through its uh, initial development. Um, and as you can see from the share price, you, you, the, the initial sort of buying into the project, the announcements of the resource had much less of an impact on the share price than things towards the end here, if the pointer works, such as the awarding of off-take contracts, um, moving, sorting out your downstream facilities and things like that had a much bigger impact on the, on the, on the share price. This is what I mean by concave. It's actually kind of all of the, the, you know, the, the, the technical processing, marketing kind of issues that add value to these projects, not the, not the geological um, aspects. This, however, has a problem that it makes these projects essentially underfunded and high risk. So what happens, they're not getting, at the, the early stage, the project risk is remaining quite high because it's not really the geological risk that's the problem, it's the marketing and processing and risk that, that's, that's an issue. So the project risk remains high, and it remains high through that period where you've also got high corporate risk when you're taking out finance, develop, uh, going through the feasibility studies, constructing the project. So you have this increased sort of corporate risk phase as well. The other issue that's sort of associated with um, the concave metals that comes from this is that because you have high project risk, you don't get that big bump in the, the, the share price that sort of uh, Sirius and uh, Sandfire and, and Gold Road have got. Um, so they, uh, it makes it more difficult to raise equity to get through the, uh, the sort of advanced exploration and scoping phases. So these projects are sort of fundamentally underfunded from the beginning. There's, there's just not enough money spent on them. And it's not really the fault of the company, it's the nature of the, the, the market. So what is it that makes these, these sort of commodities, um, what we call concave commodities? Um, well, part of it is to do is that these, these projects are just difficult to develop. Um, so as a reminder, and I'm, I'm sure the people involved don't need reminding of this, but the Linus uh, Mount Well took 14 years from purchase to production and has you know, obviously had, had trouble since. Um, Alkane's Dubbo project, um, it's probably going to be something like 18 to 20 years um, by the time it's from purchase to, to their current forecast of production. A referral probably 15 to 17 years, dependent on assuming that, that you know this time they're right. As you can see, they go through multiple phases of scoping, feasibility, reviews, another feasibility study, another scoping study. These are difficult projects. So there's definitely something in that. Um, and they face a lot of sort of non-geological challenges. Um, issues with sort of government permits often, particularly in things with um, in, in the rare earth industry where you have radiation and uh, things like that. Uh, you also have issues of sort of getting the right equipment, the right people, skills, um, you know, a lot of specialists in many of these commodities. Um, financing these projects can be quite difficult where you have sort of chicken, chicken and egg type situations where you need off-take contracts to get finance, you need finance to get an off-take contract and then, the, you know, these sort of situations. So they're quite difficult projects. What's also kind of notable is that they're all difficult in their own way. So even just these three rare earth projects sort of show a different distribution of difficulties each time. So um, you know, e each project is sort of differently difficult, um, which makes th these hard, hard uh, industries to work in. Uh, another issue, uh, this is, again, the data for, for rare earths, it applies again to lithium, it applies to, to graphite, applies to quite a large number, something like tantalum probably also as well, quite a large number of, of the minor metals, is that the actual value reporting to the, to the miner is actually quite, quite low compared to say something like gold or essentially all of the value of the final uh, bullion reports through to the to the miner. Um, copper is probably something about 85 like 85 percent of the value of a, a copper cathode comes back to the miner. The smelters and refiners don't actually get that big a share. Whereas in things like rare earths, graphite, lithium, dependent on the sort of current structure, you know, the exact structure of the market, it's often near a sort of 50 to 60 percent with the various downstream uh, phases uh, attracting much more value, which is why a lot of these companies integrate operations. You know, it is economically logical to do it. Um, there are also some other issues that don't help with, with these, these markets that, again, sort of add to this sort of concaveness, this sort of reasons why investors don't attribute a lot of value at the early stages. One is that often these commodities are unknown to investors. Um, company presentations often involve 30 slides of explaining the market and four slides of what the project is. Again, that's, it's actually the right approach, but you know, it, is a, it is a problem. Um, 
high political risk jurisdictions for any commodity actually essentially do this to a, to a project, which is that if you're in a, a difficult country, investors don't trust trust the country until essentially you're, you're mining and making money and they can see you know, it being returned to you in value and dividends. And so we also have problems with um, inexperienced management and, and, and professionals um, ourselves who, you know, in these mi minor industries, don't often there's not many people who are experts on graphite or lithium or lithium brine projects or, or whatever, um, which makes it difficult to get consultants, get the, the appropriately um, uh, experienced board and things like that together. So all, all, all these difficult challenges for, for concave metals. So you, you essentially end up with a sort of a twofold kind of problem with these concave metal projects. One is sort of maintaining sort of long-term funding over the, you know, these very long development timeframes, and also actually executing really what is quite a challenging project usually. Uh, so we're now going to look at some sort of vague strategies for how you sort of deal with these, these two issues. Um, so financing first. Um, the, probably the most common, one of the most common financing strategies is essentially surfing the wave, uh, which is riding each of these little booms, raising some money, um, and, and keep it, keeping yourself going and slowly chipping away at the project. Essentially raising that, that money in, from the various fashionable commodities as, as, as they go through these different cycles helps move that sort of that corporate risk peak along. It gives a sort of a little a cash buffer to the, to the company. Um, which allows it to sort of ride, ride through that a, a little bit easier. Unfortunately, no wave lasts forever, so unless you're very adept at jumping from one commodity to another, and there are a couple of Canadian juniors who have some fantastic deposits that have managed to be sort of lithium, rare earths, and then uh, uranium, and then something else, and they ride each one each time, which is fair enough, you can do that, well done. Um, but in general, it, it's not, it, you can't, can't ride this away forever, so you need a longer term plan. Uh, the most common is probably the strategic investor, the mysterious st strategic investor, usually from China or Korea, Japan, one of the Asian countries. Um, sometimes a European or American end user, but not often. Um, arguably, these are sort of in it for the long term, so to speak, looking for, looking for security of supply rather than sort of trying to, to profit. Again, there's a bit of a be careful what you wish for type aspect to strategic investors. Um, they may be strategically investing in your commodity, but they're not necessarily in your project. Um, in that they may have a long-term commitment to graphite or lithium, but they don't have a long-term commitment to your project. Um, they just need a project to go. And often they don't need the projects to go, they're just, it's helping them with the negotiation as a sort of a game theory style so with the negotiation of their existing uh, contracts that can point to threat of new supply to help negotiate, oop, negotiate down their, their new, uh, their, their, their current contracts. So, there's a, you know, never be someone else's free option is the, the sort of the rule in, in, in game theory. So again, these can be quite difficult to manage. Uh, another sort of, the, the sort of final common sort of financing uh, strategy is essentially to sequence a convex project before a concave project. So to take something a bit, a bit more standard, a gold project, small copper project, nickel sulfide project, develop that, generate cash flow, um, or uh, you don't even have to get to the cash flow stage, use that to just increase the share price of the company, allow you to raise more equity, which you can then spend sort of more prudently and slowly over time on, on the, the more tricky concave project, which sort of takes that sort of love and need, needs that sort of tender love and uh, care. Uh, one other issue that's always worth thinking about with, with, with sort of trying to raise money in this, this area as well is this really is a, a lot of these minor metals is really an area to avoid unnecessary country risk. Um, so Linus, I guess, I guess I've, I've used the example here, which is that when they went into Malaysia, there was a lot of legacy issues to do with Japanese rare earth facilities uh, in the 1990s. And that became the overriding issue um, for, for Linus for two or three years in the project. So even though it was a very challenging project technically, it actually became even more challenging from a non-technical front. And I suppose the result of this in hindsight is that they, the two years of delays they got were right through the, 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 the best rare earth prices. So that was a really sort of sickening loss to them in a, in a way. Um, so they, to be honest, they didn't need that. Um, and and no, neither, neither does anyone else. So the, you, know, you really are vulnerable in these, these areas. So try to stick to... Um, uh, more safer jurisdictions, shall we say. Um, moving on to sort of the, the actual execution of these projects and sort of the general strategic approach you can have to these different projects. What I guess you're trying to do is 
come up with a strategic approach to market entry that essentially turns a concave project into a convex project in the, in the eyes of the investor. So it gives them reassurance that you kind of, you know what you're doing, you have a really clear and well-guided idea of how you're getting into this market. Um, so to go through various different ways this can be done. Um, probably the, the most obvious is a, a first mover type strategy, so to read the market before everyone else and get in there and get hold of the best projects first. Um, the best projects obviously are more forgiving to, to, de to, to developers and management and, and the various professionals involved in them. Um, so hope, hopefully that, that, will, that will see you through. Um, the obvious disadvantage to this, this strategy is Firstly, if you're not the first mover, you can't do this. So you need some other strategies. But also, you kind of have a first mover disadvantage as well, which is that you have to do all of your R&D in-house. And the, sort of the, the first people to enter any given minor metal usually have to sort of help develop all the local assay labs to sort of be focus on the right things, or, or essentially end up building the expertise in all the local geological consultants and getting the IAG to run seminars for you so everyone can learn about the... The, the industry, there's quite a lot of work sort of getting the, the whole industry up to speed to help you. Uh, so that's sort of the downside of that. There are plenty of examples of companies that do this, obviously, in, in Rare Earths, Linus and Mollicourt were probably the, the main sort of um, Western first movers. You'd probably argue that Talison is the example in, in, uh, in, in the lithium sector, maybe someone like Orocobra for the, um, the brines. Um, you uh, maybe zero resources for for the graphite uh, going into the land project or something like that. So you know, does does first mover strategy is reasonably common, but again, only open to some. Um, the 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 sort of closely linked to the first mover strategy is the fast follower, um, which is probably what most people most people in the the room are. Um, I don't mean that as a criticism. It's a perfectly viable strategy, um, and, and essentially, it's it's. It's a settler's strategy. If the, if, the, if the first movers are the pioneers, the, the, the fast followers are essentially the settlers. Um, and that can actually be better because you have the opportunity to learn from what the, those that have gone before. Um, hopefully talks like this, you can actually sort of learn from them and, and sort of say, well, actually, you know, we won't make those mistakes. We'll load things in this particular way. Um, generally, the idea is to acquire the sort of next best assets. The, the best ones are gone, but you can probably think more carefully about what sort of asset you might want that aligns with the sort of particular challenges of that industry or that country or the capabilities your company has and, and be a little bit more focused and, and considered in your approach. Um, often things like metallurgy and processing and some of the other technical challenges are a little bit better understood by the industry. It's easier to get off-the-shelf solutions or to get a, a, a JORC report done quickly and, and things like that. Um, but again, on the, on the downside, obviously these projects tend not to be quite as good, so you have to be a little bit more capable yourself as a, as a company. Um, and often the equity markets don't like these projects quite as much because they don't have as good metrics. So whenever people produce a list of the largest projects or the highest grade projects or the ones with the most cost flakes or whatever, they tend to be not quite at the top. So uh, you tend to lose out a little bit there, particularly with the retail investors. Um, another strategy is, is essentially to be different. Um, so this is your classic sort of differentiation strategy um, for those of you who sort of follow sort of Michael Porter type strategy. And here you, you're sort of targeting yourself towards some sort of un underserved end market that's seen as particularly attractive. You know, the, in, in rare earths you have the sort of the heavy rare earths, you might have coarse graphite or battery grade lithium or the, the sort of various different um, specific end uses. It tends, tends to be a sort of integrated approach, um, mining sort of more marginal deposits but sort of pulling out a particularly useful part of the ore putting through a specific process and producing a specific, a specific end product that you feel that can, sort of adds more value than, than a, uh, you would get from the project. Otherwise, um, obviously, there's good opportunity to sort of ride some pretty exciting markets here. Um, so it's investors sometimes quite like these projects. They like the stories, uh, particularly, particularly rare, uh, uh, retail investors. Uh, and often, there's sort of no major incumbent competitors in these spaces. They tend to be in, either on the frontier of things. Um, on the disadva disadvantage is often these projects um, are a bit more marginal. It's essentially what this, the reason people try to be different is because they can't be the best. So, you know, the, the, there's problems with the project. Again, you have a lot of technical aspects that are unknown here. There's, a lot, again, quite R&D intensive um, type projects. So it can be sort of difficult and expensive. Um, and again, sort of investors and finances are sort of unfamiliar. 
um, with, with these projects. Again, this is a reasonably common approach, sort of in the rare earth sets. Obviously, you have various sort of heavy rare earth projects in, in Australia. Um, you have a number of uh, lithium companies trying to develop um, and patent a sort of new lithium processing uh, technologies in, in Australia and around the world. So they would all be in, in this sector. Um, and obviously, in the graphite sector, you've got companies looking at integrating a bit further downstream, producing severical uh, grass up graphite or trying to produce their own expanded graphite or yeah, cool. Um, high purity graphite, various sort of different things. There's a couple even looking at producing graf graphene as, as well, right? So there's people sort of targeting these kind of uh, end uses. Um, probably the classic strategy for, for the junior explorer is, is an exploration strategy, which I see as a, as a sort of disruption type strategy, where the idea here is to essentially find a better asset than exists in the current project pipeline and sort of jump to the front of the queue. Um, Again, this has sort of potential for quite dramatic success. Um, it's quite sort of cheap up front. Exploration is much cheaper than building one of these projects. Um, so it's a slightly lower risk. Um, the fast followers ov obviously provide you with a bit of an exit strategy as they look for projects to buy. And obviously it aligns with the, the typical skill set of the average junior explorer, which is going out and finding rocks and minerals. Um, again, the downside, no, no sort of near-term cash flow. Um, and um, the sort of the time taken in this kind of, you know, you, you miss the best years of the market. Um, and also, I guess a lot of the, the sort of retail minor metals investors aren't really exploration investors. They're, they're more looking at the end products, so less familiar with the exploration industry and how it works. But again, a strategy. Um, one that's probably less considered is to produce these products as a, by, a byproduct. Um, and actually, Talison would be a good example of this, which is uh, green bushes, ciders. Uh, a tin, then a tantalum mine, then became a lithium mine. And having that incumbent infrastructure in there helps substantially with, with uh, uh, moving into new markets. And essentially, this is like a real option type strategy. Um, you can spend, take your time learning how to do things and then sort of implement the, the strategy at the right time. Um, so you do see this a little bit. Um, Another, another sort of less familiar strategy, but again, kind of viable, is a sort of bootstrapping type strategy, a sort of take a quick and dirty approach, sort of get into production, get moving, get going, um, and, and sort of move on from there. Um, obviously, the main problem with this strategy is that if there was lots of simple and cost-effective uh, projects, we'd all be doing those. Uh, so the opportunities tend to be sort of a bit of a, a double-edged sword, which they tend to have sort of longer-term longer, longer -term issues surrounding them. So this is ten, ten, sort of a temporary strategy, a stepping stone rather than a, a long-term one. And the final strategy is to actually to take an alternative road, which is to essentially do another project first. It's a bit easier, get cash flow, spend your time building capacity, capability, uh, and finance, and then tackling the more, the more tricky project. Um, just as sort of as a, as a final note, the industry tends to sort of focus a little bit on, on um, assets and strategy and, and sort of ignore capabilities and they're really kind of important in this industry. So this is the sort of who wants to be a millionaire type slide. And the point I want to make here is that if I was to ask you who is the best in class operator of these various specialty metals companies, do we have agreement on who are the better operators? Now for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through and make 100 people cast their votes. But I'm gonna assume the answers will either be don't know or reasonably well split between all of these as people disagree over who the best in class operator is. You can do the same exercise for developers, you can do the same exercise for explorers. And specifically for these specialty metals markets, you might be asking who are the best traders and marketers, who understand their markets the best, who has the capability in that. Um, Similarly, who are the best communicators? These are, these are you know, not, not well understood industries. So who is the best actually com communicating the, the, these sectors across? Who's got the capabilities there? I suspect we probably can't point to the companies that have these and the people that, the people that have these skills and we should be able to. So just to, to sort of bring it all together, um, what a sort of coherent concave project strategy looks like, and hopefully you should see some of these uh, after you know this afternoon of some of the companies presenting is you should have a you know appropriate funding strategy and you should have a viable market entry strategy but you should also have the matching internal capabilities which dependent on what you're doing might be a more technologically focused team if you are an explorer it might be a more geologically focused team and to be honest in in all of these sectors you're going to need marketing and trading knowledge you're going to need excellent 
uh, corporate communication skills. You're going to need relevant senior management who have you know, backgrounds in these industries or the appropriate uh, studies, um, and, and, and probably excellent project management skills as well. So on that note, I'll, I'll leave you to, to ponder um, if, which companies this afternoon uh, meet these criteria. Thank you.